This is Line of Thought from Conceit Media. I'm Clayton Hester. Are you threatened by a mere mortal? None shall be so beautiful as I, none so enticing. Mother, you are the one in whom the poets delight. You are the one who bewitches kings and cast asides alike. And this obscure creature, what is she? Her name is Psyche. Her name itself means soul. And don't you think implies a rival? Can she become a goddess herself? Can she become like you? She will fade as many do. And you have seen love fade and love grow. Venus was the queen of love, but she also had a cruel side. And doesn't love just have a cruel side sometimes? <laughs> oh, you better believe it. Give her unto something scornful, something wicked, something it shall woeful. Be done. Maybe that's what love sets out to do, to destroy those who are as beautiful as love itself. Cupid had a job today, a hit list to carry out. This figure, who would forever become synonymous with candy hearts, winged archer babies, and a, the feast day of Christian Saint Valentine, he was the assassin of love, the secret agent man, who fell the hearts of many. And now he had to, now he had to carry out a job for his mother. Cupid has this complicated history the Greek prototype was Eros, and this figure was both primordial, existing before the world, and he was also the son of Aphrodite, who was, of course, the Greek equivalent of Venus. Hesiod's story of creation, the Theogony, portrayed Chaos and Gaia as the only beings that existed before him. Chaos was the void from which Gaia, the earth goddess, sprang. So love has a stake in the universe before the pantheon of gods came into existence. His Roman genealogy gets complicated, too. Cicero parts it out three ways. The first scenario, making him the child of the messenger god Mercury and the huntress Diana. Kind of being difficult, as Diana was supposed to be a virgin. But it doesn't make sense in a way. Cupid runs errands and Diana shoots people with arrows. The next idea is that he's the child of Mercury and Venus, which also makes sense, because Mercury is a messenger god, and Venus is a love goddess, and Cupid is a winged baby. And lastly, there was a version of Cupid that was born from Mars and Venus. This character was identified with the Erotes, which were other gods that were love-focused. There's a lot of overlap when it comes to the jurisdiction of the gods. And as we'll see later, the idea that there were numerous Cupids was embodied in several ways, which is why in art there are so many of these little angelic infants floating around and from time to time. But to return to our story, this mission, it wasn't going to go down according to plan, because this time the god himself was about to fall in love. What happens when the gods themselves are overwhelmed by the powers purportedly under their control? This is Line of Thought, a podcast from Conceit Media about the history of ideas. This season, we're investigating the history of love and what it tells us about our forebears and what we can learn about our present moment in light of that greater tradition. Line of Thought is a podcast from Conceit Media. To get the full lineup, go to conceit.audio, C-O-N-C-E-I-T dot audio. There was this belief among the Greeks, and perhaps it was known in Rome too, with their import from the Greek pantheon into their own, and re renaming, rebranding, uh, giving it a fine touch-up. The idea was that we make gods in our own images. And this makes sense. Consider Jesus Christ, who is adopted by cultures all around the world, and is portrayed as every ethnicity under the sun. The philosophers in Ophanes was among those who famously noted that each culture depicted the gods after themselves. But if cattle and horses and lions had hands, or could paint with their hands and create works such as men do, horses like horses and cattle like cattle also would depict the gods' shapes, 
and make their bodies of such a sort as the form they themselves have. And he goes on to note different cultures that have depicted the gods with their own ethnicities and uh, their own complexions and physical features and the like. So for this storytelling venture, let's embody that, shall we? As we in investigate the history of worldviews and history of minds and the history of ideas, let's look at to our Roman myths as the portrayal of the Roman mind, the Greco-Roman mind, what they saw in love, what they saw in the world of ideas that they were nurturing and growing and adopted in many ways from the Greeks. While there are other forms of many of the stories featured in today's show, several of them are taken from Ovid's Metamorphoses. All these stories, as the name suggests, focus on change in some way, and a good number of them, love is the catalyst. Where better to start than the story of love, a life-changing variable any time it shows up as we look through the lens of Roman myth to understand this era. But in our storytelling today, we also see a dialogue with modern ideas of love. And maybe in this reflection, we see a little bit more of ourselves. If you listen to Conceit Media Podcasts, I'd be willing to bet you are the sort of person that wants to live the creative life. Big Ideas are Conceit Media's mission, and our partner, Enkindle Equip, is all about getting those big ideas out. Enkindle Equip is for the creative life. Whether you're starting on the passion that you've always aimed to get into, or you need to find a better balance in life, create a more mindful life, intentional life, Enkindle Equip is here for you as a creative professional. Go to www.enkindle.shop to learn more about our limited time discounts. I have darted many a heart. By my arrow have been many weddings, many funerals, countless kisses, 10 million tears. It was Narcissus who I made to love his own reflection. An echo to love Narcissus. Who is like you? Can I love another like you? Oh, you shall not break my heart, you shall, shall not you? not break my heart, shall you? I am the satiation for my thirst, but I, I cannot, cannot grasp, grasp you. you. I cannot, I cannot hold, hold you. you. I can drink at you, but where is, where my, is satisfaction? my satisfaction? Seeing alone, Seeing nourishes, alone my heart. nourishes my heart. Oh, that the four other senses would rush and attend me. Who could love me as I do? Why, Why will you, you not, not embrace, embrace me? me? Eye to eye, I see you, and you see me. Who makes me feel, makes so, me seen? feel so seen? Who makes, Who makes me, me known? known? Poor Echo. No words of her own since Juno's curse. The muses might impart sweet inspiration, the stuff of sonnets to the dear girl. It would be wasted. Not one utterance could reveal the depths of her love, lest it be by happenstance. Once the woods were filled with your chatter, darling of the mountain. Now what of it? Jupiter, philandering as he is blithe to do, used your talk to distract Juno. Oh, the rage of the queen when she found you out. Your idle words she replaced. Your gossip she stripped of you. You were replaced with others' words. Nothing can speak your heart's contents. Very well, Narcissus. Echo. Silly children. Each spellbound, one by reflection, one by repetition. Echo, though, perhaps you knew your error. You can never speak it. Narcissus, you will never know your error, both fading to naught, to shadows of yourself, of flowers and refrain.
Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor who ruled from 161 to 180 AD, was among the most famous of the Stoics. And these thinkers valued dispassion and balance. They valued not being lifted off the ground, swept away, carried from your place by the feelings that you feel. And their philosophy is medicine that a lot of us, including yours truly, need. <laughs> like, listen, if a pretty girl smiles at me, so much as, so much as smiles at me, I hear wedding bells. It's, it's not a good way to be, I know. It's just the deranged romantic within me. Falling in love too quickly is the hot stove I keep touching. And I keep putting my eggs in one basket and leaving them in the path of a steamroller. I keep returning to the poker table every payday and drunkenly muttering, Deal me in. Anyway, that's enough metaphors. I like to think of myself as somewhat self-aware, though. I was once at a social house, and when I asked this uh, brunette waitress for a root beer, being the teetotaler that I am, who disappoints every group he hangs out with by not imbibing, I was presented with a root beer free of charge. Returning to my group, I related the story to my friend. Don't make too much of it, he said. And I said, this can only mean one thing. He says, Clayton, don't. She wants to bear my children, I said. A spoonful of stoicism is what we all need sometimes. A little bit to draw ourselves back in, to reel ourselves back in. Any time that we get a little bit too carried away with our feelings about the present moment, with our ideas of what the present moment actually means, the way we should be reacting, and so forth. And, well, the fickle nature of the love gods, Venus and Cupid, certainly embody what Marcus Aurelius and the other Stoics were wary of. They hesitate to let themselves be overpowered by these things, knowing they'll lead to suffering. It's not for nothing that Eros, who was usually an adult in Greece, would be Benjamin Button down to being a little imp. Cupid was mischievous, and in his book The Art of Love, Ovid draws a contrast between him and Diana. Diana is a is chaste, and Cupid, embroiling his targets with passion, is the enemy of chastity. He says, See, too, the temple in the grove of suburban Diana, and the realms acquired with the sword by hostile land. Because she is a virgin, because she hates the darts of Cupid, she has given many a wound to the public, and will give many still. The expectation that women remain chaste today is usually rebuffed for being restrictive and oppressive towards women. But Diana wanted to remain a virgin forever so that she would not be bound to a man. Instead, she's independent. She's the female version of Bear Grylls combined with Henry David Thoreau, living in nature, hunting, eating frogs. Well, maybe not. Maybe that's just Bear Grylls. But the thing of it is, I, I, and I may be generalizing about this, I could be totally wrong, but making a short overview of art in which Diana is depicted, she seems to be usually better clothed than many of the goddesses, as they're depicted throughout the art history of the world. And, well, th this is an important part of the myth, too, because if you come up on her naked in the woods, she will mess you the f*** up. One myth tells the story of Acteon, who was a hunter, who saw her bathing, she subsequently had him turned into a stag and his own hunting dogs chased him down and killed him. Now that's integrity. I got a lot of respect for that. Ah, Diana, but thou knowest love too, or perhaps tales told of another self knew love too, and ye knew love's tragic taste. For men of Hellas, her counterpart Artemis fell for Hunter Orion. Mine arrow flies sharp and sweet, and right it was that though felt it once too, maiden. Alas, though, the treachery of either your brother Apollo, or our mother Gaia. Apollo, some say, tricked you to draw the arrow and challenged you to fire at a distant spot on the sea. The spot was your love. Tragedy. Gaia heard Orion boasting of his hunts, that he could kill the animals of all the earth, and she sent her scorpion to slay him for his mindless chatter. Oh, sweet huntress, your father loves you. Your only love he turned into stars immortal in the vast night sky. I am but the courier of romance. It is the muse Erato who speaks of love's charms and harms. Surely she must have spoken through Virgil in saying in his eclogues, Omnia vincit, amor et nos sedimus amori, love conquers all, 
Let us too surrender to love. Virgil's words echo down through the centuries. Love conquers all. Do we still believe that, though? Or is it just a nice idea? Is it a good thing to put on a pendant or something like that? What does it even mean? Does it mean love will make everything okay? Does it mean we all fall to love? Is it just something that you should say at a wedding? Well, it's followed up with a phrase that tells us a lot. Love conquers all us to surrender to love. Our hearts might get broken, but let's love anyway. This is from book 10 of Virgil's Eclogues, where Gaius Cornelius Gallus, friend of Virgil's, is imagined dying of love in the idyllic rural land of Arcadia. Gallus is seen as being a major source of elegiac love poetry. He's seen as the root of this tradition for other poets, including Ovid. Here's Virgil's Gallus. This now, the very latest of my toils, vouchsafe me Arethusa, needs must I sing a brief song to Gallus, brief, but yet such as Lycoris's self may fitly read. Who would not sing for Gallus? So when thou beneath Sicanian billows glidest on, may Doris blend no bitter wave with thine. Begin, the love of Gallus be our theme, and the shrewd pangs he suffered, while hard by, the flat-nosed she-goats browse the tender brush. We sing not to deaf ears, no word of ours but the woods echo it. What groves or lawns held you, ye dryad maidens, when for love, love all unworthy of a loss so dear, Gallus lay dying? For neither did the slopes of Pindus or Parnassus stay you then, no, nor Aeonian Aganippi. Him even the laurels and the tamarisks wept. For him, outstretched beneath a lonely rock, wept pine-clad Menelus and the flinty crags of cold Lycaeus. The sheep, too, stood around. Of us they feel no shame, poet divine, nor of the flock be thou ashamed. Even fair Adonis by the rivers fed his sheep, came shepherd, too, and swineherd footing slow, and from the winter acorns dripping wet Manalcus, all with one accord exclaim, From whence this love of thine? Apollo came. Gallus art mad, he cried. Thy bosom's care another love is following. Therewithal Sylvanus came with rural honors crowned, the flowering fennels and tall lilies shook before him. Yea, and our own eyes beheld Pan, god of Arcady, with blood-red juice of the elderberry, and with vermilion, died. Wilt ever make an end? quoth he. Behold love wrecks not aught of it. His heart no more with tears is sated than with streams the grass, bees with the citisus, or goats with leaves. Yet will ye sing, Arcadians, of my woes upon your mountains? Sadly, he replied, Arcadians that alone have skill to sing. Oh, then how softly would my ashes rest, if of my love one day your flutes should tell. And would that I, of your own fellowship, or dresser of the ripening grape had been, or guardian of the flock. For surely then, let Phyllis, or Amintus, or who else, bewitch me. What if swart Amintus be? Dark is the violet, dark the hyacinth among the willows, neath the limber vine, reclining would my love have lain with me. Phyllis plucked garlands or Amintus sung. Here are cool springs, soft mead and grove, Lycoris. Here might our lives with time have worn away, but me mad love of the stern war god holds armed amid weapons and opposing foes. Whilst thou, ah, might I but believe it not, alone without me and from home afar, Looks upon alpine snows and frozen rhine. Ah, may the frost not hurt thee, may the sharp and jagged ice not wound thy tender feet. I will depart, retune the songs I framed in verse Chalcidian to the oaten reed of the Sicilian swain. Resolved am I in the woods rather with wild beasts to couch, and bear my doom and character my love upon the tender tree trunks. They will grow, and you, my love, grow with them. And meanwhile I with the nymphs will haunt Mount Menelus, or hunt the keen wild boar. No frost so cold, but I will hem with hounds thy forest glades, Parthenius. 
Even now, methinks, I range o'er rocks through echoing groves and joy to launch Sidonian arrows from a Parthian bow, as if my madness could find healing thus, or that God soften at a mortal's grief. Now neither Hamadryads know nor songs delight me more. Ye woods, away with you, no pangs of ours can change him, not though we in the mid-frost should drink of Hebrus's stream, and in wet winters face Scythonian snows, or when the bark of the tall elm-tree bowl of drought is dying should under cancer's sign, in Ethiopian deserts drive our flocks. Love conquers all things, yield we too to love. These songs, Pierian maids, shall it suffice your poet to have sung, the while he sat, and of slim mallow wove a basket fine. To Gallus ye will magnify their worth, Gallus, for whom my love grows hour by hour, as the green alder shoots in early spring. Come, let us rise. The shade is wont to be baneful to singers. Baneful is the shade cast by the juniper, crops sicken too in shade. Now homeward, having fed your fill, Eve's star is rising. Go, my she-goats, go. Now we turn to a different poet, rather, rather different poet, well, one who certainly knew the overwhelming power of love. Lucretius is a one-hit wonder, at least only one of his works survives. He wrote the poem On the Nature of Things, which covers a wide range of topics from atomic theory to ethics, and he was an influence on Virgil too. Lucretius invokes Venus as the mother of Rome, delight of gods and men. He's a lot to say about love, though, with one section in the book entirely being about the passion of love. This whole book about capturing the philosophy of the universe, of course, takes considerable time to talk about love as a passion and a love as it overwhelms us. And Lucretius knows love can spell trouble. This craving tis that's Venus unto us. From this engender all the lures of love. From this, O oh, first hath into human hearts trickled that drop of joyance which ere long is by chill care succeeded. Since indeed, though she thou lovest now be far away, yet idle images of her are near and the sweet name is floating in thy ear. But it behooves to flee those images and scare afar whatever feeds thy love and turn elsewhere thy mind, nor with thy thoughts still busied with one love, keep it for one delight and so store up care for thyself and pain inevitable. For lo, the ulcer just by nourishing grows to more life with deep inveteracy, and day by day the fury swells aflame, and the woe waxes heavier day by day. Unless thou dost destroy even by new blows the former wounds of love, and curest them while yet they're fresh, by wandering freely round after the freely wandering Venus, or canst lead elsewhere the tumults of thy mind. Love and duty, must you two forever vex one another? Aeneas, the forefather of Rome, found himself in Carthage. There Venus and Juno acted to enchant your hearts. How vain am I to wear this diadem and bear this golden scepter in my hand? A burgonet of steel and not a crown, a sword and not a scepter fits Aeneas. Oh, keep them still and let me gaze my fill. Now looks Aeneas like immortal Jove. Oh, where is Ganymed to hold his cup and Mercury to fly for what he calls? 
Ten thousand cupids hover in the air, and fanny it in Aeneas' lovely face. Oh, that the clouds were here wherein thou fledst, that thou and I unseen might sport ourselves. Heaven's envious of our joys is waxen pale, and when we whisper, then the stars fall down to be partakers of our honey talk. Anxious cares already seized the queen. She fed within her veins a flame unseen. The hero's valor, axe, and birth inspire her soul with love and fan the secret fire. His words, his looks imprinted in her heart improve the passion and increase the smart. Now, when the purple morn had chased away the dewy shadows and restored the day, but when imperial Juno from above saw Dido fettered in the chains of love, hot with the venom which her veins inflamed, and by no sense of shame to be reclaimed, with soothing words to Venus she begun. High praises, endless honors you have won, and mighty trophies with your worthy son. Two gods a silly woman have undone. Nor am I ignorant you both suspect this rising city which my hands erect, but shall celestial discord never cease. Tis better ended in a lasting peace. Jupiter heard the cries of his son, King Iarbas, who loved Dido, and so he sent Mercury to send Aeneas away. Go, mount the western winds, and cleave the sky. Then, with a swift descent, to Carthage fly. There find the Trojan chief, who wastes his days in slothful riot and inglorious ease. Then thus with winged words the god began, resuming his own shape. Degenerate man, thou woman's property, what makes thou here, these foreign walls and Tyrian towers to rear, forgetful of thy own? All-powerful Jove, who sways the world below and heaven above, has sent me down with this severe command. What means thy lingering in the Libyan land? If glory cannot move a mind so mean, nor future praise from flitting pleasure wean, regard the fortunes of thy rising heir. The promised crown let young Ascanius wear, to whom the Ausonian scepter and the state of Rome's imperial name is owed by fate. So spoke the god, and speaking, took his flight, involved in clouds, and vanished out of sight. The pious prince was seized with sudden fear. Mute was his tongue, and upright stood his hair. Revolving in his mind the stern command, he longs to fly and loathes the charming land. What should he say? Or how should he begin? What course, alas, remains to steer between the offended lover and the powerful queen? This way and that he turns his anxious mind, and all expedients tries and none can find. Fixed on the deed but doubtful of the means, after long thought to this advice he leans, Three chiefs he calls, commands them to repair the fleet, and ship their men with silent care. Some plausible pretense he bids them find, to color what in secret he designed. Himself, meantime, the softest hours would choose before the lovesick lady heard the news, and move her tender mind by slow degrees to suffer what the sovereign power decrees. Jove will inspire him when and what to say. They hear with pleasure and with haste obey. But soon the queen perceives the thin disguise, what arts can blind a jealous woman's eyes. She was the first to find the secret fraud, before the fatal news was blazed abroad. Love the first motions of the lover hears, quick to presage, and even in safety fears. Nor impious fame was wanting to report the ships repaired, the Trojans' thick resort, and purpose to forsake the Tyrian court. Frantic with fear, impatient of the wound, and impotent of mind, she roves the city round. Less wild the Bacchanalian dames appear, when from afar their knightly god they hear, and howl about the hills, and shake the wreathy spear. At length she finds the dear perfidious man, prevents his formed excuse, and thus began. Base and ungrateful, could you hope to fly and undiscovered scape a lover's eye? Nor could my kindness your compassion move, nor plighted vows, nor dearer bands of love. Or is the death of a despairing queen not worth preventing, though too well foreseen. Within the secret court, with silent care, erect a lofty pile exposed in air, hang on the topmost part the Trojan vest, spoils, arms, and presents of my faithless guest. Next under these the bridal bed be placed, where I my ruin in his arms embraced. All relics of the wretch are doomed to fire, for so the priestess and her charms require. Thus far she said, and farther speech forbears. A mortal paleness in her face appears. 
Yet the mistrustless Anna could not find the secret funeral in these rites designed, nor thought so dire a rage possessed her mind. Unknowing of a train concealed so well, she feared no worse than when Zacchaeus fell, therefore obeys. The fatal pile they rear within the secret court exposed in air. The cloven holms and pines are heaped on high, and garlands on the hollow spaces lie. Sad cypress, vervain, you, compose the wreath, and every baleful green denoting death. The queen determined to the fatal deed, the spoils and sword he left in order spread, and the man's image on the nuptial bed. All else of nature's common gift partake. Unhappy Dido was alone awake, nor sleep nor ease the furious queen can find. Sleep fled her eyes as quiet fled her mind. Despair and rage and love divide her heart. Despair and rage had some, but love the greater part. Then thus she said within her secret mind, What shall I do? What succor can I find? Become a suppliant to Hyarba's pride and take my turn to court and be denied. Shall I with this ungrateful Trojan go, forsake an empire and attend a foe? Himself I refuged and his train relieved. Tis true, but am I sure to be received? Can gratitude in Trojan souls have place? Laomedon still lives in all his race. Then, shall I seek alone the churlish crew, or with my fleet their flying sails pursue? What force have I but those whom scarce before I drew reluctant from their native shore? Will they again embark at my desire, once more sustain the seas and quit their second tire? Rather with steel thy guilty breast invade, and take the fortune thou thyself hast made. Your pity, sister, first seduced my mind, or seconded too well what I designed. These dear-bought pleasures had I never known, had I continued free and still my own. Avoiding love, I had not found despair, but shard with salvage beasts the common air. Like them, a lonely life I might have led, not mourned the living, nor disturbed the dead. It is then that Mercury returns and bids Aeneas hurry along, and the pious prince obeys and so ends the love of Dido, with the tragic end that awaits so many of love's victims. Then swiftly to the fatal place she passed, and mounts the funeral pile with furious haste, unsheathes the sword the Trojan left behind, not for so dire an enterprise designed. But when she viewed the garments loosely spread, which once he wore and saw the conscious bed, she paused, and with a sigh the robes embraced. Then on the couch her trembling body cast, repressed the ready tears, and spoke her last. Dear pledges of my love, while heaven so pleased, receive a soul of mortal anguish eased. My fatal course is finished. And I go, a glorious name among the ghosts below. A lofty city by my hands is raised, Pygmalion punished, and my lord appeased. What could my fortune have afforded more, had the false Trojan never touched my shore? Then kissed the couch, and must I die, she said, and unrevenged, tis doubly to be dead. Yet even this death with pleasure I receive, on any terms tis better than to live. These flames from far may the false Trojan view, these boding omens his base flight pursue. She said and struck, deep entered in her side the piercing steel with reeking purple dyed. Clogged in the wound the cruel weapon stands, the spouting blood came streaming on her hands. Her sad attendants saw the deadly stroke, and with loud cries the sounding palace shook. Distracted from the fatal sight they fled, and through the town the dismal rumor spread. First from the frighted court the yell began, redoubled, Thence from house to house it ran. The groans of men with shrieks, laments, and cries of mixing women mount the vaulted skies. Not less the clamor than if ancient Tyre or the new Carthage set by foes on fire, the rolling ruin with their loved abodes involved the blazing temples of their gods. And so we join Cupid as he arrives at his destination, the palace of the princess Psyche. A beautiful thing she truly is. She walks the palace grounds. Cupid eyes her. He eyes potential loves, despicable, heinous creatures he could send to her. 
as Venus has demanded. He doesn't have his head in the game, though. He reaches for his arrow. Ow. And in the process, he pricks himself with his own arrow. Psyche, maiden fair. Her fated mate shall be me. But not everybody was clear on this point. Psyche has no suitors. That is actually quite sad. As Aspileus, the original author of the myth, would write, The miserable father of this unfortunate daughter, suspecting that the gods and powers of heaven did envy her estate, went to the town called Milet to receive the oracle of Apollo, where he made his prayers and offered sacrifice, and desired a husband for his daughter. But Apollo, though he were a Grecian, and of the country of Aeonia because of the foundation of Milet, yet he gave answer in Latin verse, the sense whereof was this, let Psyche's core be clad in mourning weed, and set on rock of yonder hill aloft. Her husband is no white of humane seed, but serpent dire and fierce as might be thought, who flies with wings above in starry skies, and doth subdue each thing with fiery flight. The gods themselves and powers that seem so wise with mighty Jove be subject to his might. The rivers black and deadly clouds of pain and darkness eke as thrall to him remain. The king sometimes happy when he heard the prophecy of Apollo, returned home sad and sorrowful, and declared to his wife the miserable and unhappy fate of his daughter. Then they began to lament and weep, and passed over many days in great sorrow. Could love conquer all? Zephyr, tireless west wind, fetch for me that love I seek. Take her from her mirthless chambers and bring to me her tender face. Thus poor Psyche's being left alone, weeping and trembling on the top of the rock, was blown by the gentle air and of shrilling Zephyrus, and carried from the hill with a meek wind, which retained her garments up, and by little and little brought her down into a deep valley, where she was laid in a bed of most sweet and fragrant flowers. Invisible forces attended her on the mountain. She was aided by powers all around her, and Cupid, though he would not appear to her directly, visited her each night. And now is known to me the powers at my command. See at last the maiden fair at hand. And yet I cannot see you. Reveal yourself to me, love so tender. This request alone I cannot render. Have you not heard the loss, the pangs that were cost, when once Jupiter gave to Stimula himself? The king of gods, ruler of the Olympian court, shown himself to a human lover who, for her love, yes, was great, and such was his. He gave himself. The sight is far too great for mortals to bear. At times he courted as a bull, and others as a swan. I would merely remain a voice tender and sweet to charm thee, astonishing jewel. To me, loneliness is a common companion, and you relieve me of that empty burden. But oh, that you had arms to hold. I shall visit you again, and I shall charm thee all the more. There is a great fire I kindle here, there is a great danger at hand. And so Cupid thinks to himself about the situation that falling in love has gotten him into. There is a great fire I kindle here. There is a great danger at hand. This thing that has so oft wrought tragedy now consumes me. Can it be that I too will bring tragedy on myself? Once upon a twilight's gloaming in the city of Babylon, the birthplace of Grand Ziggurats, there did live two star-crossed lovers by the names of Pyramus and Thisbe. Theirs was a love as profound as the deepest ocean, yet as forbidden as the fruit in Eden. Their homes were divided by a wall as implacable as their parents' feud. Upon this loathsome wall was a chink, scarce wider than a serpent's slither, through which the sweet nothings of their love were whispered. Their words, imbued with the purity of their affection, did render the cold stone warm. A plan was thus conceived in secrecy, a tryst under the mulberry tree by Ninus's tomb, bathed in the silver glow of the moon. Thisbe, fair and fleet of foot, arrived first. The night did seem welcoming until she did espy a lioness, fresh from her kill, her maw stained crimson. Fear took the heart of the maiden, and she took flight, dropping her veil in her haste. The lioness, lured by the fallen garment, rent it asunder, leaving it bloodstained upon the earth. Pyramus, true to his promise, came upon the scene, his eyes beholding the gruesome sight of Thisbe's torn and bloody veil. His heart was cleaved in twain, for he believed his love devoured. Thus despair took hold of him, and he fell upon his sword, the red lifeblood draining from him, soaking the roots of the mulberry tree. When Thisbe, having evaded the lioness, did return, 
She found her love lying lifeless, his lifeblood staining the mulberries a dark crimson. Heartbroken, she clasped Pyramus's sword with a sorrowful resolve and followed her love into the arms of death. So it is told, the tragic tale of Pyramus and Thisbe, their love as enduring as the stones of Babylon, their end as sorrowful as a nightingale's lament. And the mulberry tree, once white, does bear the dark burden of their loss, its fruit forever reddened by the lifeblood of the lovers. In the time when gods made sport and dalliance amongst mortals, there existed a love most unrequited between the radiant Apollo, god of the sun, and the fair Daphne, daughter of the river god, Peneus. On a day of golden sunshine, Apollo chanced upon me, toying with my arrows of love and disdain. In a moment of hubris, Apollo, in all his sun-drenched glory, chided me, deeming my arrows unfit for one so youthful. The slight did not go unnoticed, and I vowed retribution. As Apollo traversed the green expanse, his gaze fell upon the maiden Daphne, her beauty rivaling that of the woodland nymphs. In that instant, I let fly two arrows, one of gold to stir love in Apollo, and one of lead to sow aversion in Daphne. Struck by this golden shaft, Apollo's heart was set aflame with love for Daphne, but she, pierced by the leaden arrow, found her heart filled with dread and loathing for Apollo. Consumed by a passion as bright as his chariot, Apollo pursued Daphne, his pleas of love echoing in the air. Yet the fair maiden, driven by the insidious spell, did flee from Apollo's advances, her heart a tempest of fear and revulsion. In her flight, Daphne prayed to her father, the river god, to rid her of the body that had earned Apollo's unwelcome affection. Hearing her plea, Peneus transformed Daphne into a laurel tree, her soft skin turning to bark, her hair to leaves and her arms to branches. Apollo, arriving too late, could only embrace the laurel tree that was once Daphne. His love, unfulfilled but undying, proclaimed the laurel as his sacred tree, its leaves forever adorning his lyre and his quiver, an eternal testament to his love for Daphne. Thus, in the verdant quietude of the woods, stands a laurel tree, once a maiden, forever the object of the sun god's love, a reminder of the folly of hubris and the power of loves. Yea, can Mother Venus relent in her ire, or is sorrow foregone that we be lovelorn? Are two hearts forlorn? She rewards devotion, I know it well. When once did a sculptor come under love's spell? In the days of yore, when ancient gods held sway, there resided a craftsman of peerless skill in the Isle of Cyprus. Named Pygmalion, he was a sculptor of such masterful hand that his creations rivaled those of nature's own design. Yet his heart held a disdain for the company of women, for he had seen the Propoetides, maidens who had denied the divine Venus, cursed to sell their affections and cast aside their modesty. Such behavior kindled in Pygmalion a desire for solitude and the purity of his art. In his seclusion, Pygmalion embarked on his masterpiece, a statue of a woman wrought from ivory. His hand, guided by divine inspiration, captured beauty so perfectly that it seemed a living maiden frozen in time. He named her Galatea, and paradoxically found himself captivated by her lifeless perfection. The heart of the lonely artist was ensnared, his affections no longer his own. He treated the statue as his consort, adorning her in finery, offering her gifts, and whispering sweet nothings to unhearing ears. The pallor of love's sickness cast a shadow over Pygmalion's days. On the festive day when Venus was honored throughout Cyprus, Pygmalion offered a prayer at the goddess's altar. He begged for a bride, the living likeness of his ivory maiden. Venus, moved by his genuine affection, understood the unspoken wish behind his words. When Pygmalion returned home, he approached his beloved statue. As he pressed his lips to hers, warmth bloomed under the cool ivory. Beneath his disbelieving touch, the rigid form softened, the pallid ivory flushed with life. Galatea, no longer a statue but a woman of flesh and blood, opened her eyes to gaze at her maker and lover. The tale of Pygmalion and Galatea is thus told, a testament to the redemptive power of love. A story of a man who shunned love, only to be consumed by it, and a statue brought to life by the grace of a goddess, united. Here I am lonely for so long. Let me go home among my sisters by my father's side. This I can grant thee, take leave with the wind.
Where hast thou been, daughter dear? Away with love, father true. I have been taken to a majesty ne'er I known before. And your suitor, who is this that has borne thee away? A magical thing, a beautiful soul. And his face, who is he? I've ne'er seen it. Beat. Father, awfully pale thou dost look. Speak to me your grieving. To me a mystery was foretold. An oracle from the sun god, rider of the skies, cast the fate for which thou hast been fitted as one wed to a monster from hellscapes deep. It burdens me, it breaches my heart. I know not who this phantom suitor is, but I fear him something phantasmagoric. Can it be that such a love is what I am damned for? I know not. I know only what I have heard. I prithee find out this being, be he blithe or abomination. And so she would find him out. The tired Cupid one night on their mountain would take rest there, and she would find him that night, seeing him as he was. Not as a horrid monster, but a beautiful, divine man. But she would make the same mistake. Finding his arrows, realizing him to be Cupid, she stumbled onto one of the points and fell deeper in love with him. What? No! Away from me, mortal woman. I have commanded you ne'er to behold me as I am, and see me now as I am, if not in celestial light. You would not have me know that my love is love himself. You know not what weighs our circumstance. I must fly. But Psyche was now in love. She wanted him, as he wanted her. And she made her way to the temple of Venus to ask for the love of Cupid. Venus, light of love, giver of hearts to hearts. I have known thy son as my lover and husband. Give to me this romance from heaven. A statue, a countenance of stone, stood before her. A thundering sound like a whip's crack. Thou who hath bewitched mine son's heart, thou standest afore me seeking to gain my grace, to see Cupid once more. Yes, divine Venus, tis so. I love him with all my heart and soul. I seek thy pardon and thy aid. Pardon thou seek? Very well, I'll grant thee a chance. Fulfill the tasks I set before thee, and perchance I shall consider thy plea. The maiden Psyche is tasked with sorting out a great mound of mixed grains, barley, oats, beans, and corn, into separate piles before the night falls. Yet in her hour of need, a colony of ants moved by her plight, and perhaps by some invisible hand, sorts out the grains, completing the task as the sun kisses the horizon. Luck, not more. But let's see if thou succeed in thy next task. Fetch me golden fleece from the sun's fearsome rams. For a second task, a gentle reed counsels her to collect the fleece ensnared in briars rather than confront the fiery rams directly. Very well. Next, thou must fill this flask with water from the river Styx. An eagle, emblem of mighty Jupiter, fetches the water for her. Fine. One final task. Bring me a box of Proserpina's beauty. In the underworld, Psyche is granted the box by Proserpina. Her curiosity overwhelms her and she opens the box, only to fall into a death-like slumber. There lies Psyche, frozen in mortal slumber, the box of beauty cast aside. How I know the story of death that severs love. Attend to my tale, good folks. A tale of truest love and most profound grief. Tis the tale of Orpheus, the sweetest lyrist that e'er graced the earth, and his beloved Eurydice, a maiden fair as the morn's first light. Oh, how Orpheus did love his Eurydice. The lark's song was naught but discord to his ears when compared to her soft-spoken words. The roses did pale in beauty next to her blush. He loved her with all his soul, 
with a love as vast as the firmament, as constant as the North Star. But alas, even the most glorious day hath its dusk. Stricken was Eurydice by a vile viper's bite, its venom seeping into her veins, claiming her life as its cruel prize. Into the dark domain of Hades she was drawn, leaving her Orpheus in the world above, a world turned gray and cold in her absence. Bereft and desperate, Orpheus sought to bring his beloved back from the shades, venturing into the underworld himself. With his lyre in hand, he coaxed such sweet music that even the harsh stones of Hades did weep. He played his lament before Pluto, the lord of the underworld, and his queen Persephone. His song did move them such that they agreed to release Eurydice, on one condition, that Orpheus not look back until they had emerged from the underworld. Ah, t'was a task easier said than done. For as they neared the surface, Orpheus, overwhelmed by fear for his beloved, did turn to look at Eurydice. In doing so, he broke his promise, and Eurydice was swept back into the underworld, this time for eternity. Thence was Orpheus left alone, his lyre's song ever more sorrowful, the joy of love, the sting of loss, the cruelty of hope, and the harshest punishment of fear. Such were the lessons taught to him. Yet he did continue to sing, his voice echoing through the ages, a testament to his undying love for Eurydice. Cupid seals the box, the sleep of death confined once more. He touches Psyche. His gentle touch is as the breeze, and as if his touch held magic, she stirs. Cupid carries Psyche aloft, up to the heavens. They appear before Jupiter. Cupid beseeches his divine assistance. Jupiter, mighty god, grants Psyche divine form. Unite us in immortality as in immortal love. Enduring trials as thou hast, your love and lover have found favor in my eyes, and this may yet cause you to refrain from inspiring treacherously so many heartbreaks. And so it was. Psyche became immortal, a goddess herself. And her love would burn an eternal flame now. And perhaps they still live as the story goes. They had children of their own. And well, one hopes that such a love story lives on. One tragedy that can turn back from the tragic. The first author of the story, Apuleius, tells the story in the frame of a broader narrative. He thought that it's, in some sense, an allegory, a platonic allegory of the soul's ascent into heaven, of what love does ascending upward. But as with every culture, love is complicated, among, as it is among the Romans. Cupid's arrow conquers all, including Cupid, and love conquered all. As for Cupid and Psyche, it conquered even the prophecy of the oracle, something that's seldom seen. Anytime an oracle shows up in myth, the oracle always wins. That's the root of most tragedies. There's much tragedy within the stories of love. There's much elegy. But there's, also much, but there's also much romance. These stories seen, such as the Aeneid, explore the inner life of their characters in fascinating ways. While these don't dive into the characters the same way the modern novel does, we've embarked in an opportunity here. We've realized the minds of these characters. And we end now with one last piece of poetry. It takes us back to Venus. <laughs> Even though she may be awfully ruthless at times, she's still the queen of love. The Vigil of Venus, this piece of poetry, doesn't have a clear publication date, nor does it have a decisive author. It's an important poem. It's an immortal poem. A beautiful celebration of love, of springtime. Tomorrow, what news of tomorrow? Now learn ye to love who loved never. Now ye who have loved, love anew. It is spring, it is chorusing spring, tis the birthday of earth and for you. It is spring and the loves and the birds wing together and woo to accord, where the bow to the rain has unbraided her locks as a bride to her lord. For she walks, she our lady, our mistress of wedlock, the woodlands atween, five and the bride bed she weaves them, with myrtle enlacing, with curtains of green. Look aloft, list the law of Dione, sublime and enthroned in the blue. Now learn ye to love who loved never, now ye who have loved, love anew.
She paints the purple year with varied show, tips the green gem, and makes the blossom glow. She makes the turgid buds receive the breeze, expand to leaves and shade the naked trees. When gathering damps the misty nights diffuse, she sprinkles all the morn with balmy dews. Bright trembling pearls depend at every spray, and kept from falling seem to fall away. A glossy freshness hence the rose receives, and blushes sweet through all her silken leaves. The drops descending through the silent night, while stars serenely roll their golden light. Close till the morn her humid veil she holds, then decked with virgin pomp the flower unfolds. Soon will the morning blush, ye maids, prepare in rosy garlands bind your flowing hair. Tis Venus's plant, the blood fair Venus shed, or the gay beauty poured immortal red. From love's soft kiss a sweet ambrosial smell was taught forever on the leaves to dwell. From gems, from flames, from orient rays of light, the richest luster makes her purple bright. And she tomorrow weds, the sporting gale unties her zone, she bursts the verdant veil. Through all her sweets the riffling lover flies, and as he breathes her glowing fires arise. Let those love now who never loved before, let those who always loved now love the more. Now fair DNA to the myrtle grove sends her gay nymphs, and sends her tender love. And shall they venture? Is it safe to go? While nymphs have hearts, and Cupid wears a bow? Yes, safely venture, tis his mother's will. He walks unarmed and undesigning ill, his torch extinct, his quiver useless hung, his arrows idle, and his bow unstrung. And yet, ye nymphs, beware his eyes have charms, and love that's naked still is love in arms. Let those love now who never loved before, let those who always loved now love the more. She sings, but we are silent. When is my springtime coming? When shall I become like the swallow so that I may cease to be silent? I have destroyed my muse by being silent, nor does Apollo respect me. It is in this way that Amiclay, when it would not speak, was destroyed by silence. Tomorrow let him love who has never loved, and who has loved let him love tomorrow. Conceit Media. Big ideas live here.